Welcome to our new series, Escapes from the Novus Ordo. I'm your host, Stephen Heiner, and with us for this series, the very first episode, is Father David Phillipson. Hello, Father. How are you? Hello, Stephen. Good. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm I just uh, reflecting on our conversations over the, the last couple of days and hearing your story, which is uh, unbelievable. I've heard so many of these escapes in, in different contexts, but everyone is is similar in some ways and, and different in their own. And I think for our listeners, I, I would say there's there's a director's cut future edition, which we can do, which covers, I think, even more of Father's story. But today, I just want to do some broad, broad sketches. And we'll start just with the present. Father, who who are you? Where where are you located? And, and what are you doing? I am Father David Philipson, and I am located in a small town in upstate New York in Phelps, New York, and I work at a uh, independent chapel called Mary Help of Christians. So going back to, I would say, your confirmation, I think this is important <clears throat> because it relates to how Catholicism was in your household and played part of your journey in, in your high school year. So what was the deal with confirmation and your mother's, let's say, feeling of duty around Catholicism? Right. My uh, mother, I believe, uh, felt an uh, obligation to have her children raised in the Catholic faith. And so she ensured that we had been given at least the sacraments of initiation, baptism, First Holy Communion, and confirmation. And um, after that, I think she believed that she had done what she needed to do, and then we were free to decide whether or not we would continue with the faith that had been given to us by nuns, but not necessarily encouraged or promoted at home. And so what is this time period? You were confirmed in the 70s? Right. I think around 1970. Okay. Yeah. And so your brother, who's gone off to college ahead of you, a few years older, has been enlightened at college about the reality of things and calls back and tells his little brother that he's wasting his time going to Mass on Sunday. Right. Um, and um, that made a lot of sense to me um, because it didn't really mean anything to me. I had no idea what they were doing up there. And um, when I weighed the pros and cons... Uh, as to what I could be doing if I didn't go to Mass, I realized I could be making an extra $2 an hour pushing carts at a grocery store, and that made a lot more sense to me than going to Mass on Sunday. And for our younger watchers, it was $2 an hour, let's say more like $15, $16 an hour these days. And this led, obviously, to... I wouldn't say a crisis with Catholicism. You you just left it in a, in a certain sense and pursued different paths. And however, that those paths had their own crises, which brought you back here, back to your your hometown, and and to someone named Brother Gabriel, Brother Brother Gabe. Right. So initially, I went back to my old high school in order to seek out a priest who was who had been very influential in my spiritual formation, having given me an introduction to the prominent disciple of Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, and I became very much under the influence of Carl Jung, and this priest was responsible for introducing me to him. So uh, this priest meant a lot to me, and so in order to kind of sort through and make sense of my life at that point, um, after high school, and during college, I went back to my old high school to seek this priest out. It turns out he didn't have any time for me, but then he handed me off to the vice principal who, I'd, who was new at the time and I had not met. And when we sat down for about a three-hour uh, conversation, um, he got my life story at that point, and I was interested in trying to find out from him where was the nearest Buddhist monastery that I could check into in order to find spiritual support for my spiritual journey? And he told me I didn't need to go to a 
a Buddhist monastery. All he needed to do was to read these two books, which he just happened to give me. And those two books uh, actually changed my life. Well, the watcher, the people who are watching are going to ask you what those books were. Right. The first book was Beginning to Pray by um, an Orthodox, uh, I think, bishop, patriarch. And the other book was Finding Grace at the Center by Basil Pennington and another uh, Trappist uh, priest uh, of the likes of uh, Thomas Merton. So in that one book, Finding Grace at the Center, um, what was good about it for me is it provided a bridge from my Buddhist practice past into Catholicism, um, but it presupposed that the practitioner of centering prayer had faith. And I had been antithetical to having uh, faith or believing without seeing or believing without experiencing. Um, I wanted to just experience, and that was certainly consistent with the Buddhist path, but in finding grace at the center, faith was being presupposed. So in considering what this book was proposing, I uh, made a decision, and it was a decision that changed my life. I realized that what was missing in my spiritual journey, what uh, was perhaps responsible for the crisis that I was in, is because I was lacking faith. And so I, decide, I decided to take God in faith um, and to allow God to bring me to salvation instead of me, in a Pelagian way, trying to save myself. And ever since then, um, my life went through a 180-degree turnabout, and um, I haven't looked back. Well, I'd really love to go deeper down that, but as I say, you know, faith is a decision. I think that's such an interesting idea. But there's, there's still so much more of your story that we have to talk about. But... <clears throat> In any event, you you take this 180 degree turn, as you say, and Brother Gabe helps you first, I think, examine some monastic vocation paths, and you end up finally looking at the diocesan priesthood as what would make the most sense for you. Well, actually, he was not in favor of the monastic path. This was something you wanted to do. This was something I wanted to do. And he didn't think that that was suitable for me. Um, but um, when I was uh, given a newsletter of a monastery in Washington, D.C., to do a, uh, which had an advertisement to do a vocational retreat there, a vocational monastic retreat, I jumped at the opportunity after graduation. And, and so I did that. And then uh, throughout the next uh, decade or so, um, I continued to consider uh, a monastic uh, vocation, but when, uh, with the Carthusians, it finally became apparent to them, and then eventually to me, that I did not have a Carthusian vocation, I got another spiritual director, and we eventually decided that the diocesan priesthood would be more appropriate for me. And which seminary did you want to go to? At the time, the uh, most conservative seminary that I knew of was Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And what year is this? This would have been in 1999. Okay. And so you found a seminary, now you have to find a diocese who's going to pay for you to go to the seminary. Right, and I found a seminary that I wanted to go to, and then... Um, uh, I was advised to then try to find a diocese that would send me there. And as it turns out, I had been traveling in the Southwest where I met a seminarian by accident who then introduced me to the vocation director who then invited me to study for the archdiocese. And um, I said yes, provided that uh, they would send me to Mount St. Mary's and they were eventually willing to do that. 
And so I spent four years at uh, Mount St. Mary's Seminary. And you'd already had some philosophy and theology at Fordham, so you didn't have to spend as much time as, let's say, a, a student who'd started from scratch. That's right. That's right. And at this time, I, I, w I was smiling because you're the third former Novus Ordo cleric that I've interviewed, and your stories intertwine. Um, we know the Father Retro character that Father Chicada created in, in Work of Human Hands, the Beretta-wearing, cassock-wearing, ad orienta mass-saying, uh, Latin-inserting priest. And there was a cabal of you, right? These are the people who exchanged Michael Davies' cassettes, <laughs> you know, secret copies of Latin Mass magazine are circulating. And w there are a couple of things that I found interesting. One was the idea of, I've got to survive through the seminary, and then afterwards I can be who I, I really want to be. I, I can't really be who I want to be here, but I have some secret friends and, and we know each other. But the, the, the other side of it is that you, you told a story about Mediator Dei, which I found fascinating. And I'd, I'd like you to share that. Sure. Um, primarily, our theological training revolved around encyclicals, magisterial teaching from Vatican II and Vatican II only. All the great saints, JP II, right. VI. Well, they weren't saints yet. Um, and uh, I was fine with that. Um, that's the way theology and the faith was being presented, and I thought I was getting the real deal. Um, and sometimes there would be mention of, or maybe somebody might mention, you know, an ancient encyclical like of Pope Pius XII, or I don't know if anybody mentioned anything earlier. Uh, that would have been... Way back in the 40s way back, and 50s. Way, that would have been, you know, I never heard of anything that far back, right? <laughs> but... Um, so I was intrigued and curious, and all that wasn't on my reading assignment, I decided to read Mediar Today. Uh, and I thought I was reading magisterial teaching, and I thought magisterial teaching, uh, we were bound to obey it. That's what I thought. But uh, when I read Mediar Today, uh, which is on the, the liturgy, and his warning not to make certain changes in the liturgy, um, I found out that everything he warned against was actually taken up in the Second Vatican Council and it's the reform of the Mass in 1970. And so I was perplexed because I knew we had to be obedient to magisterial teaching, but then the question was, well, which magisterial teaching did we have to be obedient to? And so I asked uh, a um, priest history professor, um, basically, well, could he explain why Mediar Today uh, warns against the very things that the New Mass advocates? And uh, could he explain that? And he said he could not. He didn't know. He didn't have an answer. And so these are the people that are teaching me how to be a priest or teaching me theology. And for him not to be not to have an explanation, um, well, actually created a little bit of a crisis. Well, what, what am I supposed to do? And that means I had to operate, so to speak, or think outside the box of my seminary in order to come up with an explanation for how it was possible that we have two magisterial teachings teaching really diametrically opposed things. Right, this was before the hermeneutic of continuity and the hermeneutic of rupture were in common parlance, right? Right. So you keep your head low, you get ordained, and you make it to your first assignment. I think this was 19, uh, this would, no, I was, I was going to say 1999, but the 1999 was the permission from the UC, uh, USCCB to wear the cassock, right. which was something you, you thought was going to help you with your new bishop and say, well, as you can see here, Your Excellency, it says that I can wear the cassock, and the reaction was... Right, so even before I entered seminary, um, I wanted to wear the cassock uh, because it looked more sacramental than a business outfit. Um, and in seminary, there were, again there was this kind of underground uh, group of seminarians that would pass information among each other Some is that, that um, was very helpful 
in uh, grounding ourselves in the belief that we could actually do, shall we say, traditional things. And one of them was the wearing of the cassock. So in the seminary, the cassock was only allowed if you were serving mass, and not any other time. And if you wore the cassock at any other time, you could be in, your, your vocation would be in jeopardy. But once you're ordained, they can't take the ordination back. So I decided I was going to wait until I was ordained to, to wear the cassock. And I did all the time. And two months later, there had been numerous complaints, not from the lady, of course, but from other fellow diocesan priests to the bishop. And the bishop had had enough and then gave me a call almost exactly two months after my ordination, and told me I couldn't wear the cassock as I had been doing. And then when I um, sent him the uh, USCCB decree in December 1st, 1999, uh, that I could wear the cassock, it was just dismissed. And at that point, I knew that everything that we had been taught in seminary, that the church follows law, like canon law, I knew that that simply wasn't true in practice. Well, and I think it's interesting because we're not, we're not even talking about the traditional mass or anything yet. We're just talking about wearing the cassock, and it's such a hateful thing to the modernist, this sign of mourning, this sign of detachment from the world, this sign of continuity with tradition. This is a hateful thing. It must be banned, and you must be told that you cannot, and your waiving the authorization didn't do you any good. Right. And it put you on the bishop's radar. I was already on the bishop's radar a long time before that. Well, yes, actually, uh, your, first, your first mass with your pastor was quite an experience. Right, but even before then in seminary, um, the uh, bishop was being informed about his seminarians, and I am sure in retrospect that uh, the bishop knew uh, what kind of seminarian I was, and that's why he put <clears throat> me with this particular priest at this particular parish, because I believe, again, in retrospect, that his purpose or mission from the bishop was to liberalize me. And so he watched me like a hawk to make sure he undid any shall we say, conservative uh, tendencies that I might have picked up in the seminary. and um, like, like saying the offertory prayers uh, sotto voce. Right. So that was an... I didn't get that from... The, I, just re, I just read the rubrics. That's all I had to do is um, do the red and read the black. And I was reading the red, and it said this prayer may be said out loud... Um, which would assume that, normally speaking, it would not be said out loud. So I decided to follow the rubrics. At my first Mass, at the parish, in which nobody else was present, it was a private Mass, it wasn't a scheduled Mass, but my uh, pastor was walking up and down the aisle, uh, watching everything that I was doing. I couldn't understand why, until after the Mass. I... Um, had already decided that I was going to make a resolution to make a Thanksgiving after... I had already been doing that in the seminary, making a Thanksgiving after Holy Communion. I wasn't going to stop that just because I was a priest. So I was making my Thanksgiving in the church, uh, many, many pews away from the um, sanctuary, and uh, minding my own business, uh, saying my prayers of Thanksgiving on my knees. No one else is in the church. And the pastor comes up in front of me and starts waving his finger at me and telling me I had no right to say those offertory prayers in silence. And when I pointed out to him that the rubric allowed for that, he denied it. And he continued to berate me. You will never do that again. <laughs> well, as it turns out, I learned the lesson of not doing it again, but he did apologize to me that night after he actually he looked at the Mass and realized that I was correct, that I could do what I've done, but I decided not to ruffle his feathers anymore, at least at that point, and decided to do the offertory prayers out loud. So this, the, was the cassock incident where 
where you had said, I'm, I think I'm going to need to transfer. Right. And, and he said, I'll give you, I'll come back to you in a little bit. Right. So after I got the phone call from the bishop, um, in which I couldn't wear the uh, cassock as, as I'd have been doing, um, it didn't take me very long to realize, well, if I can't wear the cassock, and that was one of the, shall we say, resolutions of my wanting to be a priest, well, then I didn't want to be in that, I wanted to be in a place where I could actually wear the cassock. And so I, I spoke to the uh, vicar general, who was very amenable and very kind, and I told him I want to be transferred to another, another diocese. And he communicated that to the bishop, and um, th the word that I received back was that he would actually consider it, but in three years, which was extremely generous of him and extremely kind, whereas most priests in my position who had been persecuted, especially in their first year, were trapped inside their diocese, and the bishops would never allow those priests to leave their diocese. They, 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 they figure they paid for your training, right. they're going to keep you, they That's have limited right. bodies on hand as it is. That's right. So you would say, all right, let's, let's follow this, we'll see what happens in three years, but it doesn't take that long, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the story that I appreciate, because once again, this goes back to some of my conservative Novus Ordo experience myself, that you're going to try to dress this up as much as you can. I spent a lot of time with the Norbertines in California, and they introduced me to the Latin Novus Ordo and private masses and wearing black for requiem masses. This was a whole new world for me. And communion on the tongue. And you had a young couple who had known you and, and that wanted to get married and wanted you to do the marriage, and they wanted it as dressed up as possible. So you gave them, I think, Eucharistic prayer number one mm -hmm. with the parentheses, I'm, I'm assuming. <laughs> And you've got an on you stay, you've got, you know, you've got everything you could load up as, as much as possible. Everyone afterwards is happy. This was wonderful. Thank you, Father. That was great. Except the authorities. Right. Um, so I had asked that the canon or Eucharistic prayer number one, uh, which I was going to say in Latin, be translated in English for the benefit of those who were attending the wedding mass. And so these uh, booklets were laying around after the mass. Of course, I didn't think anything about it. Um, but then the pastor was at another church, at their church. The pastor then picked up one of these booklets and found out that there were translations from the Latin in the mass. And I think he was quite bothered by that because he wrote a four-page single-space typed letter to the bishop, to the director of liturgy, to my dean, and to myself, saying that I clearly didn't understand Vatican II, I didn't understand Vatican II theology, I was not being pastoral because I was forcing my conservative ideas on this poor couple, even though they were the ones to request the Mass to be done in the way that I did it, and that I probably had done the traditional Latin Mass, even though I didn't have a clue as to how to say it at the time, and therefore I needed the bishop's permission, and therefore I was in disobedience. And I thought, well, since nothing in that letter was true, um, the bishop, of course, would never accept this as plausible, but uh, when he had to decide as to whose side he would be on, whether on uh, my side, who had been ordained maybe for a year, or the pastor's side, who had been maybe ordained for 40 years, he chose to be on, Unsur the, unsurprisingly. be on the side of the pastor and told me that I had been uncharitable. I should have uh, warned him what I was going to do, even though I didn't know that he had an allergy to Latin. If I knew you were going to expose these poor lay people to Latin. Yeah, I mean, I mean, right. So this was a, a concrete instance in, in which I realized that Latin was considered to be toxic, mm. even though I had been taught that it was the mother language of the church. And that the faithful had asked you for this. Oh, that's right. Well, so you don't need to wait three years, it turns out. <laughs> so this, was, this occurred at the end of my second, at the end of um, 
Right, that's right. And in my second year, and uh, with uh, the bishop's reproach for what I had done in being uncharitable, he also said, because I had caused so much trouble um, in the space of two years, I had earned for myself not one, but two petitions to be removed from my second assignment because I mentioned the evils of abortion and the need to vote pro-life four times in the space of two months. And uh, and I did many other things. Well, you were told you can only give one pro-life well, sermon after, a year. After that, I was told, yeah, one pro-life sermon a year. <sighs> and um, I also did other things like wear the priest's black clerical clothing on a priest retreat. I mean, that's what I thought priests were supposed to do, but I would found out that if I had shown up with a Hawaiian shirt, short pants, flip-flops, uh, that would have been, well, totally acceptable. You were the weirdo in I was clerics. the weirdo in, in clerics. So I did a lot of things that really ruffled the feathers of the, of the diocese, and, um, and I think uh, many priests were happy when I actually left. So the bishop at that point after the disaster at the wedding mass ceremony, uh, he allowed me to leave right at that point after two years, and I asked for a year discernment uh, in order to f kind of figure out where I would go. And at this point, as I, as I said, there's lots of twists and turns at your story, lots of different, shall we say, stops on the train. But this first one is with the Fraternity of St. Peter, and I was very edified. You said that the the priest who taught you how to say mass was on you like a hawk, just clipboard, clipboard. I've, I've watched a lot of these clipboard sessions myself, but correcting, correcting. And I think you said two weeks of dry masses and then a week of, of real masses, but he was still watching you during the real masses as well. That's right. So yeah, I owe to uh, this priest of the fraternity um, a lot. Um, and he had been an MC in, in his seminary formation, and so he knew the, the Mass backwards and forwards. Um, and uh, I had prepared for these Masses with about a month of eating, drinking, and sleeping rubrics and video watching of the traditional Mass and, and so forth. Um, but uh, he had been known as somebody who was fairly strict back then, and he still is known for similar strictness even today. Um, but I really appreciate um, what he did uh, for me, uh, because the Mass itself requires this kind of exactitude, which is something totally foreign to the New Well, mass. and that's what scared you off in the beginning, right? Right. From, from possibly celebrating it. The, the Novus Ordo is, is simple. And so you think I can do this, but wow, you know, the traditional Latin mass with the offertory and holding the, the right things in the right places and the right times. And uh, how do I turn around? I don't, I don't, I don't look at the, the faithful when I turn around. All of these things, as you say, the attentiveness, I think, is part of what helps remind the priest that this is an act of public worship. This is not my own private thing, which is always what we had in the Novus Ordo growing up. How's everybody doing today? I can't hear you. Uh, this sort of personalization of the Mass at the, there's no personality to the traditional at Mass. It's said the same by all the priests, and part of that is this drilling down and making sure this is what it says in the book, do this, mm -hmm. and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Now, you also spent some time with another prominent traditional congregation, and as part of their, let's say, onboarding process, you were asked to read... Uh, was it true pope, false pope, one of these right. giant tomes which has been addressed by Father Jakata in, in excellent in excellent method and style. You can find those videos on YouTube if you're looking. But you were asked to do effectively a book report, and you need to come and say, and here's why this book is so great. And, and you did effectively with some other priests who were studying with you and then a superior. And what was the response? Well, actually, yeah, the... I thought that's what they wanted me to say, but as it turns out, it wasn't. <laughs> but anyway, I did read the book, and I thought they made an absolutely convincing argument that setting the contents was impossible because they addressed every single argument. 
And um, and I thought, well, that's I thought that's why they wanted me to read the book to make sure I didn't go down that uh, rabbit hole. Um, so I did my book report. It was essentially a regurgitation of what was said in the book, a very brief uh, regurgitation. Um, and so I basically concluded, yeah, that uh, we can't be, nobody can be a, a set of contest. It's not Catholic. And uh, it, if I wasn't uh, prepared, my jaw would have dropped uh, because the uh, priest formator, teacher, uh, published author, um, reacted as if, well, I think it's more complicated than that. And I'm thinking, what? Is this a test? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then one of the other priests, um, who had been a very uh, prominent uh, speaker in, shall we say, Latin mass circles, um, he also chimed in and, and thought, uh, there's probably other arguments out there that are not uh, included in the book, and we really need to have uh, the possibility that uh, sedificantism is a viable option. So, well, I mean, I didn't know what to, to do with that, except, um, except just to shelve it real quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's fascinating because that's part of the, they're going to make you read this book, but the people doing the formation, they don't even entirely buy this book. Right. Hook, line, and sinker. Now, you, you were working for this, this congregation, but you revealed something else which I've known because, uh, because I've had a chance to do some interviews and, and talk w with people, but there is a, a minority, a sizable minority, of people who do not accept as valid the orders of Novus Ordo clerics within this organization. <clears throat> and some prominent individuals went to one of your superiors and said, I will not have something to the effect of, you know, his, his hands to defile the altar, um, his invalid orders. Now, for your part, I think when we talked about it, you were not opposed to the idea that this could be a situation that needed to be resolved, that maybe you, you could, you, you were not opposed to saying, no, no, I will never have a conditional ordination. You were open to this, but this organization was not open to it, correct? Correct, right. I had asked for it previously, um, even before I was working at the organization, and uh, they said they kind of handled these kind of things on a case-by-case -case basis, and when my case actually came up for review, they said that my ordination was perfectly valid, so I had no recourse to uh, having a conditional ordination, um, but yet it did become an issue, not with the organization, but with uh, a couple of the prominent parishioners who it was either me or them. Right, and, 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 and in this organization, the prominent faithful win. That's right. And so they, they weren't catechized and explained, well, let me explain to you why Father's ordination is valid, because they don't accept it. Right. It wouldn't matter who explained it to them. And you were then removed from public rotation, shall we say. Right. And, and it, it's fascinating to me because I've, one of the priests I've spoken to at this organization, I was pushing on validity of of Novus Ordo ordinations, and then uh, I, I, I was trying to go a roundabout way. Would you, would you tell a faithful that he or she could go to confession? And you say, oh, well, you know, conscience, et cetera, et cetera. I said, would you go to confession with one of these priests? And before, I, I, I don't think I'd even finished the question. He said no. He said no so instinctively. And I thought to myself, I didn't, I didn't make an accusation of him at the time because I think always my respect for the priesthood sort of trumps anything I want to say. But I thought, I cannot believe you would send faithful to confess to someone you wouldn't and that you wouldn't tell the faithful, I wouldn't confess. Do you understand the difference in messaging if you say, well, I would never go to confession with that person? And this is a, a priest in with this, affiliated with this organization more than 20 years. And so there is a divide in that, in that organization between people who just accept the party line, yes, everything's fine, everything's valid, versus people who instinctively, they can't articulate to you why they may not have read Father Chicada's works or any of the other literature on it, but they just, they just don't want to have anything to do with it. And you sympathized with this because, as you told me later, you wanted everything about your priesthood to be traditional. And what was strange was you were not 
that the holy orders that you received were not traditional and this and this bothered you and you weren't even allowed to remedy it because the organization's policy had said you were fine we don't do that they don't want to ruffle any feathers now something else that i find fascinating and i think you're the first in, in that i know of in this category a category of one a non unicum novus ordo cleric hmm. so tell us a bit about how this issue became important for you and what happened after well um i'll have to back up i had a friend uh i have a friend named uh jason and uh, i met him at a fatima conference and he was struggling in his conscience as to whether he should start going to society masses coming from the fraternity and I tried to assure him, yeah, that was totally Catholic. It's totally fine, you know, for him to do that. And um, eventually he did. And he returned the favor when, after he became sedificantist, to bar bombard me with emails with quotes from popes, doctors of the church, and saints, and canon law, and theological treatises that all supported the Sedificantist thesis. Initially, I just knew to kind of uh, dismiss them. You know, I mean, this is clearly he's gone off the deep end, and uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to pay. And there was too long. I, I didn't have any time to, to, to read. But, you know, occasionally I would read one or two, you know, just out of curiosity. And uh, once again, it, um, they sounded very logical and convincing. I had first uh, been exposed to the Sedificantist um, thesis um, when I first started saying the traditional mass. Uh, but I was told not to go down there, um, and I didn't. Um, who was I? I mean, I couldn't have figured this out, even though it seemed pretty, pretty logical. So at this time, you know, I'm reading these emails occasionally throughout the years, and... Um, I come across a uh, article in Latin Mass magazine. I was um, at a place where the previous priest had ordered, subscribed to Latin Mass magazine, and uh, although I was no longer a fan of it, uh, nevertheless, I had nothing better to do. I was eating lunch, and I decided so to open it up. And there's an article by Dr. Peter Kwasanowski. And uh, it was on the canon. Well, I'm certainly interested in the canon. And he basically focused on one particular line in the canon, which is the unukum line of the canon, in which the priest inserts two names, the name of the pope and the name of the local ordinary. Um, and he did a kind of a historical liturgical analysis of that sentence within the canon. One of the things that I found out was that in the early church, if the uh, faithful didn't like the particular name that the priest uh, was inserting into the canon, they would revolt. They, had, they would have a fit because they didn't think that particular bishop was orthodox, and so they wanted nothing to do it. And apparently that was probably when the canon was still said out loud. And so I thought to myself, well, so it really makes a difference as to what name you put there, and, and it makes a difference to the faithful. Um, so, but it was more of the, the grammatical and logical analysis of the sentence that convinced me that uh, I could no longer put the name of Francis in the canon. <laughs> so in, I had already studied a little bit of logic in ninth grade when I had nothing better to do except to read my brother's older brother's math books. <coughs> and uh, the and clause is particularly strict because both sides of the clauses must be true for the sentence to be true. <coughs> so if it's raining cats and dogs, uh, both dogs and cats must be raining for the sentence to be true. <coughs> <coughs> and in this case, um, in this particular sentence in the canon, we have on one side the names to be inserted, and those names are connected by the conjunction and to the phrase orthodox believers, and then to another phrase 
that they also must be professing the Catholic and apostolic faith. <clears throat> well, that's a tall order. They, so that means the names that are inserted in the canon must be three things, Orthodox believers and professing the Catholic and apostolic faith. Well, everybody that I knew at the time didn't think that Francis qualified on any of those scores. And so I had to decide, knowing that <clears throat> this was a sentence that I was offering to God at the Mass, whether I was willing to lie to God, because I knew it wasn't true that if I put Francis's name into the canon, that he was an Orthodox believer and a... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, member of the held the a, apostolic a professor faith. professor of the Catholic uh, and apostolic faith. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean that was impossible. He even denied that the, the God was Catholic, and um, uh, so there was no question that he didn't qualify. And so the only question was whether I was going to lie to God at Mass by putting his name into the canon. And I couldn't understand at that point how anybody could put his name into the canon. So I I simply stopped doing it. You didn't broadcast this. Did I did not. <laughs> but uh, you're the first Novus Ordo non-unicum, Novus Ordo cleric who was a non-unicum that I've, I've ever met. Uh, at that, at, I didn't meet you at that time, but hearing that story, I think it's wonderful because unfortunately we still have some set of a contest who haven't figured out the unicum issue. Mm -hmm. But you figured it out when you were still a Novus Ordo cleric, and I think that's a great testimony to you. So now, Father, you're going to have a chance to address this nagging issue, which we've alluded to, which is conditional ordination, that you were, you were in a position to, to take a look at this, finally, and someone helped you with this. Right. <clears throat> um, so I had heard about the problem, you know, being working within traditional Catholic circles, um, there were some who were adamantly against uh, receiving the sacraments from a priest who was not ordained traditionally by traditional bishops. And, and although the organizations that I worked for didn't consider it an issue, there were some faithful who did, and in some cases refused to go to, to my masses. <clears throat> I um, heard the argument that uh, Archbishop Lefebvre would say, even if the priest himself thinks his Novus Ordo ordination was valid, for the sake of the faithful, it would be good to have him conditionally ordained. Uh, so I was inclined uh, toward that, but um, I was not uh, permitted to be conditionally ordained. <clears throat> um, but then, um, I don't know how how maybe somebody sent it to me or whatnot. But anyway, I, I read uh, Father Jenkins' uh, article on the doubtful validity of Novus Ordo consecrations and ordinations uh, uh, that was written in the 1990s. It was published in some uh, journal of some sort. And his position was that he was not going to decide one way or another whether it was valid or invalid, but just to decide whether or not there was positive doubt. And if there was positive doubt, that was sufficient not to trust those consecrations or ordinations. And the evidence, um, in a sense, had been clear and became very clear that there was, of course, positive doubt as to the Episcopal consecrations, I mean, radical changes there, but also radical changes in the rites or rituals that surrounded the Novus Ordo ordination, um, which didn't exactly add up to the same enchilada when it came to the Novus Ordo ordination. <clears throat> so um, I was now in a state of doubt with regards to my own ordination, <clears throat> and I wanted to resolve that doubt. Uh, once again, my friend, uh, Sedificante's friend, 
um, assisted me in that and gave me three names of bishops that I could contact who could help me with being conditionally ordained. I chose the one that I had already known, <clears throat> and he was very willing to assist me in this goal to be conditionally ordained. And this was Bishop Williamson? This was uh, Bishop Williamson, that's correct. And this was 2019? 19. Okay. So you are now a Catholic priest. Right. And I, we're, Catholicism is not a religion of feelings, but nevertheless, you did reflect later that when you, after you had been uh, conditionally ordained, that as you were saying the Mass, you, you felt, in a certain sense, uh, like, a, like a real priest. All right, so first of all, there's now peace, total peace. Mm -hmm. I have, there's no questions anymore. Sometimes the questions would come up uh, in my mind as I was saying Mass. You know, is this really happening or not? Mm. Um, but now that, that was a, a non-issue. It just wasn't happening. Um, and I felt I was being honest uh, with people um, that as I was saying the traditional Latin Mass and administering a traditional Holy Communion, that I was doing so as a traditionally ordained priest. So there's cons consistency there. So 2019 is right before 2020. Right. And as we know, something happened in 2020. Right. And the organization you were working for at the time, I think, had had a position that they were not going to have a public public mass. They were going to conform with whatever the municipality uh, had said. And you were going to say mass anyway. I think this was Passion Sunday. Correct. And as lay people will do, might make a phone call. So, Father, are you going to be saying mass? Yes. Well, would you call the police if I you know, came to Mass? No, I wouldn't. But, you know, you tell one layperson this, and you've, you've told a whole lot. Okay, so about 75 people uh, showed up to the Mass, and uh, I thought it went very well. Um, one person um, expressed amazement at my sermon and... Uh, Everybody was very appreciative because otherwise they wouldn't have gone uh, to Mass. And I, I think you said some people drove from very far away, no? Right. So there were two families that actually drove five hours just to go to confession wow. and to Mass. Um, and everybody else was more or less local. Um, but there was um, one person in particular that uh, did not appreciate uh, what I was doing. And uh, even though Bishop Schneider and Archbishop Vigano both had said, if your bishop tells you to lock your doors to disobey your bishop, um, I followed that advice, but I was then accused of being disobedient and um, that was the last straw. But it wouldn't have been one, I mean, these people who came from all over, they didn't go and tell your superiors, right? Right, right. It was one person from that particular chapel that did. Who was not your friend, who That's decided right. he was going to report you for, for giving the mass and sacraments to people. Right. Which is, which is unfortunate because uh, that was probably something they very much needed. Uh, but in, as, as you say, in any case, that was it final straw for them. That's right. So Passion Sunday, so it's Holy Holy Week uh, coming up soon, but you then have to leave. This was the event that uh, caused you to leave that organization. And, and you had some, obviously some other twists and turns, but now you find yourself up in New York, um, some hours away from here. If, if about five hours. About yes. five hours. So now you're driving five hours right. <laughs> uh, to come here. <laughs> And you're occasionally here for, I think, some fraternal support because right. there aren't any other priests up there with you. Right. And uh, to, to, to see and, and uh, to spend some time with us. And obviously, we're, we're happy to have you here. Well, thank you. And I think w there are so many ways I'm heartened from your, your, your story, Father, but I think uh, when you think about the thread that gets you from 
I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip Sunday Mass, too. I'm a traditional non-unicum set of a contest priest. Is there a particular saint, a particular devotion, a particular mindset you feel has carried you through to this time period? Um, <clears throat> I, I think my answer uh, is uh, more philosophical than it is devotional or even theological. And um, that is, I, as I reflect back, um, I have been, shall we say, passionate or concerned about a pursuit for truth and the willingness to allow truth to lead me wherever it might lead me. And our Lord considers himself to be the way, the life, and the truth. Um, so uh, for me, it's following him as the truth um, that has led me to um, being here today. Well, and I see that in your journey, because a lot of these moments are quite logical for you with Unakum, with getting your, your ordination, with um, saying, hey, I can wear the cassock. All of these, these were moments of logic that were then tied against the context. Okay, well, I'm getting pushed back on, or this is the, this is, uh, I, I go back actually to your, your talk about centering prayer and says, well, I can't have centering prayer if I don't have faith. And then you said, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to take that leap. And that is fascinating for me because I think so many people really struggle with, with faith. The friends and acquaintances I've had over the years who we talk about religion or we talk about this question of faith, they say, I just, you know, I just don't have it, Stephen. You know, I'd like to have it. I, I want to have it or whatever it might be. And for you, it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of struggle. It was something that simply made sense to you. Well, actually, it didn't make sense to me, but I came to the realization that that was my problem. Mm. Um, and... Um, and I realized that without it, I would probably be uh, heading down the wrong path. <clears throat> well, as, as I promised uh, those who are watching and who are listening, that there's a, much more to the, the story with Father, but just today we're going to get a uh, back of the envelope and quick, quick view. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to, to sit down with us, Father, and being the first in this Escapes from the Novus Ordo series. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. My pleasure. And we'll see <clears> you <throat> next time for another one in this series. Um, thank you from all of us here at Most Holy Trinity Seminary.